Thank you for joining us today. We hope that you receive a blessing from this program. We hope that you will join us in person this Sunday at 930 for Sunday school and 1035 for the service. We promise you will receive a warm welcome. For more information or to watch our services live, please go to gpindy.net. Now let's join the service already in progress. come before you right now just giving you praise for who you are lord we thank you for your wonderful grace in our lives thank you for the opportunity we have to be here this morning in your house just to lift you up lord we just pray that you continue to be with the rest of the service lord be with pastor jim as he brings the message you've laid on his heart lord we ask your holy spirit just to speak to our hearts um, lord god may we take that message and apply it to our hearts that somehow you might be glorified through it and, Lord, we thank you for the offering. We ask you to bless it, Lord. Use it to further your kingdom. And we pray and ask all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
you can only come this far and who showed the moon where to hide till evening whose words alone can catch a falling star well I
each morning and you love the cry and raindrops that melt winter snow and you love tall gentle forest and there will something you love even I can give I know and if it's praise you love Lord I'll praise you though my words sound so unworthy of great beauty and I felt my gifts weren't worthy to bring to a king but then your word reminds me of how much you love me yes you
altar now there has been beauty these eyes have seen It was in the night Through all the storms of my life Oh yeah, that's where God proved He proved His love for me So the anchor holds Though the ship is battered, the anchor holds. Though the sails are torn, I have fallen, I've fallen on my knees, and I face the raging seas because the anchor holds in spite of the storm I have fallen on my knees as I faced the raging seas the anchor holds Spite of the storm. Have you only believed? Have you only believed? You know, as we study the Bible, we understand that there was Israel, the kingdom gospel to Israel. And it was faith plus a requirement. That requirement might be circumcision. It might be keeping the law. It might be water baptism. But it was faith plus. But when we come to our dispensation of grace through the Apostle Paul, it's the mystery gospel and it's faith plus nothing. It's zero, nothing. Romans 8, 9 says this here. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If you don't have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, you're not a child of God. That's just what he's saying. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 says this, And whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also, after that ye believed that gospel, you were sealed with that holy spirit of promise when they heard the truth of the gospel they believed they were sealed with the spirit of god first thessalonians 4 14 for if we believe that jesus died and rose again even so them also would sleep in jesus will god bring with him that's uh, the calling card there that's the basis of our salvation is that jesus christ the son of god died for our sins was buried and rose again now you can look at counterfeit money, and counterfeit money, it's hard to tell it from the true money. You really have to have a marker, <laughs> or you have to have good eyes. It can really be tricky sometimes. Likewise, Satan has counterfeit gospels, and these gospels are attractive to man's pride, to man's ability, to man's own works, and by using these counterfeit gospels, he does this. Man, sinful man embraces Satan's untruths. And that keeps man blinded to the truth. And man will even arrogantly cry out against grace. 2 Corinthians 4.3 says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world, Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The apostle Paul warned the Galatians. He said this in Galatians 1.6, I marvel that you are 
so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Verse 9, he says, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ sufficient, we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. The, provision, the perversion was they distorted the fact that salvation is totally of grace. How did they pervert it? They added works. They added requirements to grace. It states in Acts 15 verse 1, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. He says in verse 5, But there arose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, they believed in the Jewish kingdom message, saying that it was needful to circumcise them, the Gentiles, the people that were coming to Christ through Paul, and to command them to keep the law of Moses. That was the perversion that distorted the purity of grace. When you require anything else, it ceases to be grace. It becomes another gospel. Grace is opposite of works. Grace is God favoring us. His favoring us is not based upon our performance, our goodness, our behavior, our works of any kind. Grace is, giving, is God giving his son to be the sacrifice for our sins. Christ took our place, took our debt of sin, our punishment of sins, the penalty of sin due us, he made the payment for our sin by dying on the cross and shedding of his blood. He then was buried, taken away all of our sin, far away, and three days later he rose alive from the dead. The father said, I accept my son's sacrifice as the final sacrifice for all sin. I'm satisfied with this sacrifice. That's the gospel. Romans eleven six 6 says, And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. In other words, it's either all of works or all of grace. You add one requirement to grace, it ceases to be grace. It's amazing grace based upon what Christ alone has accomplished. Salvation is offered to all of us as a free gift. No works by us is necessary. All we need to do is believe. Amen. Believe who he is, believe his work, that alone is enough to save you. Amen? Amen. Just believe it. It states in Romans 3.24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Romans 4, 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Verse 24. For, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. And then in chapter 5, the next verse, therefore being justified, how? By faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Any form of works is saying Christ's work is not enough. And saying that, something else is required, creates another gospel, a perversion, a counterfeit of the true gospel of grace. Now Christ's death on the cross is an offense to the pride of man. Because the cross is saying, the reason for the cross is that man in no way could ever help God save him. But Satan, knowing the pride of man, does what he does best. He counterfeits. So Satan made 
works faith. And saying that's part of the process of salvation. People swallow that hook, line, and sinker. But remember Ephesians 2, 8, 9, you know it well. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Faith, believing, is trusting, having complete confidence and dependence upon Christ of who he is and his work of accomplishing our salvation by himself, absent of any person's works at all. But today the counterfeit goes on and it fools a lot of people. It's turned works into faith in a sense. And that's another gospel. Now, I'm going to say some things that I understand that people can get saved under different circumstances. And what I mean by that, I remember I had this coal miner and we were working in this uh, trailer park and we were doing their uh, water system and uh, over in Athens, Ohio. And he said they were having a revival and he asked me if I would go with him. I went with him. It's an apostolic church. Now, if you know anything about apostolic church, you know they're charismatic beyond. I mean, they, they did everything that night. It was funny. I got an education that night. And my friend Kenny, he went forward to the altar. And after the service, he said to me, he said, Jim, listen, I don't believe in all this stuff. But I knew I had to get right with God myself. And it was in spite of what was going on, he was making his peace with God. So I understand that people get saved under certain circumstances that we don't even know about. But there are some things that people say, they're semantics or they're unaware of what they're actually saying, but just think it through with me if you would. Well, some people say this, give your heart to the Lord. That's very popular. But I ask yourself this question, where's the gospel? Okay, where is the gospel? They're told they're sinners, Christ died for them, and then for them to be saved, they needed to give their heart to the Lord in order to be saved. Let me say something to you. Understand this. This is not what God said or requires of us. God requires of us faith and faith alone. Salvation is not giving God anything. The issue is receiving a gift from God. It's not giving to receive, but it's our trust in the merits of Christ's finished work that saves us. The truth is giving one's heart to the Lord is the believer's dedication to the Lord. God wants those, only those who are already saved, to give their very being to follow him. They take God's statements regarding service, surrender, and they put it together and mix it and apply it to one being saved and say it's part of salvation. But if you put that type of requirement, it ceases to be grace. But service and salvation are two separate issues. A person needs to be justified being Christ before true service is even possible. Another familiar phrase that we throw around a lot, turn from your sins and receive Christ in your life. Turn from your sins, receive Christ in your life. And once again, I ask you, where is the gospel? Where is the gospel? Now, God urges believers, those who have been saved, who are in Christ, Holy Spirit indwelt, he wants us to live for Christ and live in holiness. We understand that. Romans 6, verse 11. 
Likewise, reckon also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. We understand God wants believers to live holy, but it's only a Christian that can turn from his sin. And when you add this other thing, you do this, then that creates another gospel. That makes this a requirement of the unsaved. Salvation is not a person doing something about their sin. That's what the gospel is all about. Christ has taken care of our sins and the issue is to trust Christ in all that he has already done, all that was necessary to pay for our sins. Even the word repent, turn from your sin. Repent is said to turn from your sins, change the direction of your life from doing evil to doing good. But repentance does not mean that. Repentance does not mean that whatsoever. And if we're, it has nothing to do with our conduct or what we're doing. To repent simply means to change one's mind. It's thinking about something in a different way. Concerning the gospel, it means to change one's thinking about their sin. They're standing before God. How to be saved. So with man, he hears the truth of the gospel. And it's at that moment they change their minds about their sinfulness. They change their mind about how to be saved and how to put their faith and trust in Christ and his finished work alone. They change their mind. This is what I used to think and believe. I'm changing my mind. This is the truth. I will believe in him. I'm repenting at that time, changing my mind. The third thing is, people say this, make Jesus the Lord of your life. For you to be saved, make Jesus the Lord of your life. Let me say something to you. Where's the gospel? Just tell me, where is the gospel? And by doing this, presenting it for somebody to be saved, that leads to what people get sidelined with, lordship salvation. Lordship salvation. They say Jesus Christ must be Lord of one's life in every area if one is to be saved or there's no salvation. We had somebody here at this church who practiced that. He couldn't tell somebody how to be saved, just believe in the gospel. He said, you have to go home. You have to beg. You have to turn. You have to repent. You have to make him Lord. You, 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 you. Well, you, 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 you has nothing to do with salvation. (laughs) It's believing in him. Amen. God does exhort us as believers. Romans 12, 1, he does do this. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. But a person can only present their bodies as a living sacrifice is if they have been raised, made alive themselves. You can't do that unless you've been resurrected, been saved. Jesus as Lord is only for saved people. Making Christ Lord and when they say that they're mixing works, self-effort with the true pure gospel of grace and that creates a false gospel. Today many are confused with the issues of conforming to be like Christ, discipleship, service with the issue of salvation. And when they do that, that creates another gospel. 
The true grace gospel is being then misquoted, misrepresented. Sometimes it said this, if he's not Lord of all, then he's not Lord at all. I like to see how many people he's told he's Lord over every area of your life right now. And I would be willing to say there's not anybody here where he's Lord over 100% of your life. And to think I have to make him the Lord of my life before I can even get saved. Something is wrong there. The implication is one can't receive Christ as Savior without making him Lord of their life. And that's just not true. Jesus Christ is Lord of all, not based upon man's making him Lord, but because he is Lord for a reason. Philippians 2, 8, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of of God the Father. Amen. Romans 14, 9 says this here. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. He's always Lord. Amen. And the reason one remains lost is because of their unbelief in the grace gospel. The last thing that I think that's important, and I know people can get saved under this expression because God's working in the heart in a different way and they have a different understanding, but you have to be careful. Satan's a great counterfeiter. They say this, invite Jesus to come into your heart. That's very, very popular. I heard it this week, uh, some people giving an invitation. But once again, where is the gospel? The focus is still what man does and still doesn't give a clear and plain fact that faith alone in the gospel alone is the issue. That's what saves an individual person. Faith in Christ as Savior is not inviting him to do anything. It's just trusting, believing in him for what he's already done to provide your salvation. That's all you do. Lost people are told they're sinners to have eternal life. They need to have Jesus sit on the throne of their life. You've seen those tracks as well as I. They must invite Jesus into their heart. Let me just say something to you. It's God who is inviting us to salvation. He's the one calling us by the gospel. The inviting is on God's part and not the other way around. The issue is, will I believe? That's the issue. Some use Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. He's standing at the door. You've seen the pictures, haven't you? Jesus on the door, so on. I used to use that myself, by the way, quite often. But the context, it's not talking how to be saved at all. Context is vital. The door is not a person's heart. Revelation 3 is dealing with God's resumption with the nation of Israel. Things that are happening during the day of the Lord for the Jewish people. It's not about today's mystery dispensation of grace. It's a doctrine, doctrinal correction and reproof of those already of his own of Israel. And if you want to know the actual meaning of the verse, he's, his knocking has to do with the declaration that the last days had arrived for Israel, not a door for a sinner's heart. Today, most call the gospel of grace because of pride, because of Satan's lie. Man must do something, add some work to it, 
So they call us who believe just in the gospel of grace is enough to save you. They call us easy believism or cheap grace. They mock grace knowing or unwittingly being ignorant. To think one could be saved by simple faith in the gospel, they snicker at that. They attack that. They don't like that. But I say to you this morning, to mock grace is to mock God himself. Because God himself declares that just what he made salvation to be, something that is simple, because he offers salvation as a free gift, and it's simply received by believing in Christ and one's complete sufficient Savior. People have made it too difficult. 2 Corinthians 11.3 But I fear lest by any means as the serpent, Satan, beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Everything needed to be done for our salvation has been accomplished by God through Christ and his finished work. To say that grace is cheap is saying God is cheap. He's the God of all grace. He's the God who sent his only begotten son and his son died on an old rugged cross. Do you know what Christ went through and then can you say that's cheap? I couldn't. So for people to say this, God doesn't say, God doesn't require, give your heart and life to Jesus. Not for a lost person. He doesn't say, turn from your sins and receive Jesus. He doesn't say, make Jesus Lord of your life to a lost person. He doesn't say, invite Jesus into your heart to be saved. Example of some prayers. Thank you for dying for me. Save me from my sins. Come into my heart and fill me with thy Holy Spirit. Another prayer. Lord, be merciful to me. I'm sorry for all the bad things I've done. I turn from, I repent of my sins, and I give you my life. Amen. God, I confess all of my sins and I ask for your forgiveness. Please take me to heaven when I die. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord Jesus, I surrender everything to you. Come into my heart and make me new and I promise to serve you all the days of my life, amen. And when you hear those prayers, they're sincere prayers. They involve real emotion. But they are not a clear presentation, a clear testimony, a clear understanding of the true gospel of grace that saves. That's the important thing. Where is the God? I know I'm a sinner. I know I can't do anything to help save myself. But God, I've read or God, I've heard that your son, died for my sins, was buried, and rose again for all my sin. Lord, I tell you right now, I believe. This is true. It's for me. I believe the gospel of grace. That's so important. And people, you ask them, we need to change our vocabulary. What did you do to become saved? And they'll tell you what they, what they, what they did. The opposite is true. It's what he did, he did, he did. And I just believe that. That's what saves us. And so we have to be careful about the way we present the gospel of grace, present it in its purity, in its majesty. Huh? In the gospel is the righteousness of God. In that little gospel, God says, I didn't want to make it difficult for you. It cost me my only son to see him suffer and go through all this, but I sent him for you to take away all your sins. 
And all you need to do is believe. Just believe it. I remember when I, I got saved. I was 24 years of age. God had been working on my heart that for a few weeks, but especially that last week. I don't know what you, what you understand or know about conviction, <laughs> but conviction creates a really heavy heart, <laughs> and it's a burden. You know you're wrong. You know you're a sinner. But you know what Christ, who he is, what he's done for you. And you want to trust him, believe in him with all your heart. And I remember sitting in the pew, and the preacher was preaching, and I was saying to myself, I wish he would hurry up and get done so I could get saved. I'm not, I'm never, I was just sitting there saying that to myself. You know something? I believed in the gospel sitting right in my seat at that moment. Had nothing to do with me going forward. Had nothing to do with me trying to get me to say a sinner's prayer or anything. I believed in my heart it was true, and that saved me. And my life has never been the same. It's been a journey. I had a lot of baggage, a lot of sin. You don't just get rid of all of it at one moment, at least I don't. And I didn't. Up and down, up and down, up and down. But boy, I gave it my shot until finally it began to level out, thank God, through growth the process of learning the word of God and truth, putting it into your mind and your heart, involvement in church so others can encourage you, make you accountable, and my life really began to change. And it all started in that day in church, sitting in a pew, and I just told God, I believe. I believe the gospel is enough for me. And that's enough for you today. Just believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again. That's enough. You don't need to do anything else but believe. And believe is not a work. Faith is a gift. The gift of God. Just receive it believing, and he'll save you. Father, we love you today. Thank you for the truth of your word. And Lord, we're not trying to put any other person down today. We just repeat what we hear. And Lord, even sometimes when it's close to being true, there's always a catch, it seems like. A catch that Satan can counterfeit the true gospel and turn it around and make it human effort. He's sly at doing that. Help us to know better than that. Help us in our own heart, and when we share this truth with other people, it's about believing in the gospel of grace alone. Just believe. God, lead somebody to us this week that we can share this wonderful truth that God is calling out sinners, and all sinners need to do is to believe what Christ has done for us. Just believe. In Jesus' name. Everybody say it. We hope that you received a blessing from today's broadcast. We would love to have you to visit us in person. You can watch us live and view past services on our website at gpnd.net. For more information, please visit our website or contact us by phone. Until next week, may God richly bless you as our prayer.